All right, it looks like the, the number of participants is stabilizing. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so welcome uh, everybody or, or welcome back if uh, you're a returner to the University of Michigan uh, Concussion Center Speaker Series. My name is Steve Rolio. I'm the director of the center. Um, the goal of our series here is to create some space where you can hear from and learn from some of the world's best concussion researchers and clinicians. And we are very excited to have our first on-campus speak, on speaker uh, today. He's, he's gonna be a good, great presentation. A few uh, housekeeping items um, before we uh, get to the formal introduction of our speaker. Um, our session is being recorded today uh, and it'll be available on our website, concussion.unich.edu. Uh, it should be up in a, in a couple of days. Um, we'll have some time for discussion following the presentation, uh, but feel free to enter questions or comments in the Q&A section, which should be at the bottom of the screen. And I believe the chat's been turned off uh, for today's uh, webinar. Um, and then the, the session has been approved uh, for CME credits. Um, so you'll receive an email after the session uh, with all the information that you need to claim those credits. Uh, and that should be coming in the, in the next day or two. So um, welcome everybody. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Almeida uh, who coordinated our speaker today and let her uh, give the introduction. Thank you, Steve. And thanks everyone for joining us today. I am extremely excited to have the privilege to introduce our guest speaker, John Letty. For those of you who don't know Dr. Letty, he's from the University of Buffalo, where he is a professor of clinical research and rehabilitation sciences. He's also a fellow of the American College of Sports, Medicine, the AMS, American College of Physicians, and the Director of Outcomes Research. He's a D1T physician and medical He's a member of the expert panel for the Bolton Fifth International Consensus Conference Board. And in construction, Dr. Barry Buller, he is the most famous doctor of the Today, we'll be discussing the theology of concussion with respect to the autonomic nervous system, describing the role of exercise quality in concussion, individualized blood threshold aerobic. And we'll discuss the principle of exercise in college. Please join me giving a warm welcome to Dr. Dalton. Thank you, thank you Dre. Um, and I want to thank uh, Dr. Brolio and Dr. Lorenc and Dr. Almeida for, and the whole concussion team for inviting me to Michigan today. Um, I'm really honored and perplexed that I'm the first live speaker you've had uh, <laughs> instead of over Zoom. So uh, I was really surprised by that, but, uh, but thank you. Um, and it's a beautiful day today. I had to take my jacket off. So uh, that only means that um, I brought my beautiful Buffalo weather with me too. So you're welcome, okay? Um, but really it's, it's a great honor to uh, present here today. I, I try to make as many of these I, as I can uh, on your Zoom uh, calls because I think uh, they've been terrific. Uh, the one last week I found really, really interesting uh, panel discussion. So it's really a pleasure uh, to be here today. Um, so I think I'll get started uh, so I can end quick. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the physiology of concussion uh, and how uh, I think it may inform our, our approach to treatment. Uh, now this isn't uh, a wide ranging talk of all the physiological aspects of concussion, there are many, but, but it's something we've been interested in uh, at UB and I hope um, you'll learn a few things from it. I do have some disclosures in terms of grant, uh, advisory board and stock options, uh, but they do not affect the content of this talk. So uh, Dr. Almeida went through the learning objectives so I won't uh, reiterate them, there they are. Um, now remember, not only your patients get concussions, so can you. And um, this reminds me of being on call overnight as a resident. So if there are any residents in the uh, room or docs, then you know exactly what this feels like. <laughs> and, uh, remembering back uh, how I felt the morning after call, it is kind of like being concussed. It really is. So it, uh, you should all be familiar with it. But let's talk about the physiology of concussion, um, at least soon after the injury. And I'm going to focus on the autonomic nervous system a bit, if you don't mind. Uh, again, um, and we're going to talk about uh, injury to the autonomic nervous system in terms of structure, cerebral blood flow regulation, and autonomic function. So we'll start off there. This little cartoon just 
goes to show that uh, the autonomic nervous system is typically thought to reside in the brainstem region of the brain. Now, it's not the only place in the brain, obviously, but this is where the cardiovascular control center is largely located. And it gets, uh, you know, so it's here up in the, in the deep part of the brain. It gets information from the barrel reflexes, from uh, the uh, exercising muscles, from the heart. And then it integrates this information and sends out signals to these organs to regulate our breathing, blood pressure, digestion, um, emotional state. It's really a ubiquitous system. And it works basically unconsciously uh, for most of us. Now, a few years ago, um, when we were developing our theories about this, we thought, well, most uh, MRI studies of the brain really don't focus on the deeper structure so much. They tend to focus on the cerebrum um, and, and the higher cortical structures because of the cognitive aspects of concussion. This is only natural. Um, but we challenged our uh, uh, radiologists at the University of Buffalo to try to look a little deeper at the brainstem. And so this was a study of patients who had symptoms for more than six weeks. Um, it was a mixture of athletes and non-athletes, but basically we, we did DTI imaging, which looks at the white uh, matter of tracts of the brain. And uh, we wanted to know, were there any changes in the region of the brainstem in these patients with concussion? And lo and behold, when you, when you do this, you see both increases and reductions in fractional anisotropy, one of the properties of DTI uh, that gets measured with, with the test. Now, you see the changes are in the brainstem area here. So that means the brainstem can be affected by concussion, at least in some patients. Now we don't really know what this means though. Is this ongoing injury? They were symptomatic. Is it adaptation? Is it healing? Uh, you know, again, we just don't really know what this means, but I think we can say that in some patients, at least the autonomic nervous system centers or the part of the brain where they're located can be affected by concussive uh, injury. Now, these are our later data now from the same imaging center. And we think about uh, not just the brainstem as being part of the uh, autonomic nervous system, but this central autonomic network that includes these structures here in the midbrain, the hypothalamus, the amygdala, the cingulate gyri, and the insula. Now remember, there are mostly bilateral representations of these organs. So this is a DTI tractography picture now of all these centers and their connections. Uh, so you can see that there's a lot more of the brain involved in autonomic control than just the brainstem. And so these are highly interconnected and dispersed areas within the brain. And you could imagine in concussion, which is a diffuse injury, that this central autonomic network uh, could be easily involved uh, in the injury. So we're gonna talk about that more in a minute. Now, autonomic nervous uh, system function is intimately related to your control of cerebral blood flow, okay? It's, not, uh, it's one of the main regulators of this uh, phenomenon. Um, and just to take a step back from concussion and look at what cerebral blood flow looks like in normal adolescence. Okay, so this was a study from the University of Pennsylvania where they looked at about a thousand healthy adolescents over the uh, time frame from about age eight years to the early twenties. And they did uh, resting uh, arterial spin labeling. And what you see is that uh, the mean values over time actually decrease from childhood into um, uh, adolescence and late adolescence, and then they start to tick up a little bit into the early 20s. And you can imagine this may be a time of brain pruning and hormonal development, et cetera, as to why you get this curve here. But one thing is to look at the amount of variation around this mean. And you can see that a 14 year old may have a cerebral blood flow at rest of 40 versus 80 or 90. And that's a very wide range in terms of cerebral blood flow. And you could imagine that that person, two people with those cerebral blood flows getting concussed might have a different response to it, since we know concussion does affect, uh, affect the vasculature. Now, how does this shape out in terms of, or shake out in terms of the sex distribution? Well, in the boys, this is what happens. It keeps going down. All this uptick has to do with resting cerebral blood flow in females. Probably has something to do with reproduction, uh, I would think, but, uh, just going to show that the sex differences in cerebral blood flow are also quite profound. And so this has to be taken into account when you think about the physiology of concussion and the response between the sexes. There are big cerebral blood flow differences between males and females too. And everyone makes fun of the fact that the boys kind of peaked at 14 and keep, keep going down. That's certainly my case. My, my mother would say that anyway. Now, we, we've tried to look at this in a, a little different way. Um, a few years ago, we, we did a, 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 or designed a study 
to look at cerebral blood flow regulation in acute concussion and in those who recovered and, and versus controls. And we built a tilt table device uh, out of materials that was compatible with an MRI. And what we do is we blow up a bladder and it inflates the foot of the device so the health head is tilted down. So we call it head down tilt. Um, it elevates the torso six degrees and then we do uh, ASL CBF. Uh, we, we do it supine. We then uh, put their feet up, uh, do it five minutes, and then we uh, put them back supine again. So they have a, a stress, they're, they're at rest, they have a stress, and then they're back at rest. Now, why do we do this? Um, because it drives blood flow to the thorax and, and then up into your head. And it actually mimics the cerebral blood flow response that you get during moderate levels of exercise. We couldn't exercise them in the MRI, so we had to do something to try to mimic uh, the cerebral blood flow response to exercise since we were interested in that. Now, these are data and they're, again, we're just looking at this because we just finished the grant, but I'm just going to show you some preliminary results that are kind of interesting, uh, both in acutely concussed males and in clinically recovered females. Remember, we did this when they were acutely symptomatic and then about 30 days later when they were recovered, males and females. And what you see uh, uh, here is the cerebral blood flow on the y-axis and the different uh, tilt table uh, settings, supine, feet up, supine here on the x-axis. And then we looked at their cerebral blood flow. The, the middles are the control values. And in green, we have people who recovered very quickly, usually within about a week versus those who took more than a month in red. And in both cases, you see the pattern of cerebral blood flow is very different between those who recovered quickly versus those who did not at the acute stage, and in females at least, when they're recovered, they have a different pattern of cerebral blood flow in response to the different portions of, of tilt uh, on the table. Now we haven't really sorted out what all this means quite yet because we just are getting the data and kind of delving into it. But you can see that their patterns are different. And this is all um, in this uh, central autonomic network, by the way. Uh, the central autonomic network I showed you before with the four or five um, uh, regions, this is the blood flow in that network uh, uh, in response to the head down tilt, both acutely concussed males and clinically recovered females. Again, just different patterns. So maybe there's some relation to um, those who took longer to recover in terms of their cerebral blood flow in that area of the brain. Again, preliminary data. Let's look at another aspect of cerebral blood flow. And this would be uh, looking at sort of global cerebral blood flow on an fMRI. So fMRI looks at local cerebral blood flow distribution to areas of active brain uh, um, activation. And in this, you put the patient in the MRI unit and you give him or her a math task to solve. And they press a button depending upon uh, what the answer is. And you do this over a series of, a series of them over five or 10 minutes to try to get them to be thinking for that amount of time, fatigue them a little bit. And then you uh, look at their cerebral blood flow before and after. And we did this in a in small study, but we had a group that got um, stretching exercise. We had a group that had aerobic exercise to treat their concussion. And we had a con healthy control group. Um, now in the people who got the aerobic exercise in terms of their clinical recovery, they were the only ones whose symptoms went down uh, significantly. This is the group that got stretching they really didn't improve that much, or at least not significantly. So they remained symptomatic. Uh, but what, we, what happened is when we looked at those with persistent post-concussive symptoms after stretching, this was their um, cerebral blood flow uh, fMRI distribution. And you can see a lot of color here, indicating that they're using a lot of their brain to solve these cognitive tasks, which aren't particularly taxing, but there's something a student might do, say, in a math class. If we look at those who got the aerobic exercise, they actually look more like the control subjects who were solving these problems with much less blood flow. That is their brains were more efficient, okay? So um, again, not a definitive study, not a randomized trial, but suggesting that in patients who don't recover, um, they're using a lot of brain resources to solve rather simple problems that before their concussion they could do without getting tired um, now, the performance between these two groups, interestingly, was the same, just that this group was using much more blood flow or resources to do the tasks. Now, what do kids complain of by third or fourth period? Fatigue. They are cognitively fatigued. And you can imagine the child with this brain blood flow might be experiencing fatigue as the day goes on. Now, what about actual function of the autonomic nervous system? 
so in this uh, study, we looked at a little different group. These are college athletes who we saw within one week of their injury. And we're, we're looking at the sympathetic nervous system uh, in this case. We're measuring uh, heart rate and blood pressure in response to a stimulus. Now, I have this lame old joke that in February in Buffalo, this is how we do it. We stick them in a snowbank and we, we, we measure their, no, this is how we do it. We have them in a lab, it's nice and warm. And we put, but we put their hand in ice cold water <laughs> and we ask them to keep it there for three minutes if they can do it. The other hand, we're measuring their beat to beat blood pressure and pulse. Okay, so we're getting continuous blood pressure and pulse measurements. And we have a group of concussed athletes versus a matched group of healthy controls. So the concussed are in the red. Now, remember, they're sticking their hand in and they're getting measured. Uh, they don't know what's coming. And so this is sort of an involuntary reflex. reflex. And if we look at things like systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, uh, total peripheral resistance and cardiac output, which is the amount of blood you're pumping to your brain every minute, you see that the concussed have a very flat, non-significant response, whereas the healthy people have a very robust response to this rather potent stimulus. This is not a comfortable uh, thing to do. Uh, we measured their symptoms. Now their concussion symptoms didn't go up, but it's, it's uncomfortable. But they had a very blunted response of the sympathetic nervous system to this stimulus, indicating that they were not engaging that branch of their ANS uh, as, the, as the normal controls did. Okay, so this is within one week of concussion. Then we wanted to look at the parasympathetic branch of the nervous system. And this is better um, uh, done with looking at something called heart rate variability, which I think everyone in this room knows about, but I'll just reiterate um, very briefly. This is the variation in time between your heartbeats. And believe it or not, if you have a very regular heartbeat, that's not as good as if it's a little irregular. It's healthier to have high heart rate variability which means your parasympathetic branch of the ANS is being engaged. Whereas very, very regular heartbeat means you're under sympathetic control. And that's not good for your general health or if you've had a heart attack or things like diabetes or depression. Um, they've been associated with uh, mortality, having low heart rate variability. So this is uh, generally measured at rest before and after a stimulus. In this um, uh, uh, experiment, we took the same type of people, college athletes within a week and healthy controls. And instead of putting their wrist in the cold water, we slammed it right on their face like that. Now you can imagine this is not all that comfortable either, but what it does, it does the opposite. It engages your diving reflex through the trigeminal nerve and it slows down your heart rate in a normal person. That's what it's meant to do. It's a very ancient reflex. And if we look at this heart rate variability, um, in terms of both the time and frequency domains, what you see here is the concussor in the open circles, the normal response is to increase your parasympathetic activation like they do here and here, whereas the concussed again have this very flat, non-significant sort of blunt response. So both branches, at least in this type of test and these concussed people are not engaging properly after the concussion. They're just not uh, switching to the uh, proper branch. Now, I found this um, recent uh, study, and Dr. Brolio's on it, uh, which I thought was interesting because we've had similar data uh, of long term autonomic dysfunction after concussion in, in athletes. And this was done in adolescent hockey players. And they were looking at, um, again, uh, similar measures of, of autonomic function after about a submaximal exercise. So, again, this is a very inter interesting study in adolescent male hockey athletes. They did it in the preseason. So, you would imagine that. Probably their conditioning is about the same. 33 males, th those with a history of concussion, one or two or more, or without concussion. And what they looked at, they looked at a number of things. I just showed you some measures of, of, of parasympathetic heart rate variability and heart rate here. And what you see is that after exercise, everybody's heart rate uh, declines at a particular, um, in a particular slope. And the more fit you are, or the more engaged your parasympathetic system is, the slower that goes down. I, I'm sorry, the faster that goes down. I, 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 I misspoke. The faster that goes down back to your resting level. And here you see that um, uh, the people with um, the normals had sort of, sort of the fastest uh, or the best decline, whereas those with one and then two concussions had slower declines in that um, heart rate recovery. So they had a suppressed cardiac autonomic recovery after moderate exercise compared with controls. And those who had more concussions had a, had a slower recovery still, indicating that there may be some sort of cumulative damage here. So 
uh, we're finding the same thing um, uh, in, in Buffalo that people who have a history of concussion for some reason have not regained full control over their autonomic nervous systems, even though they seem to be doing fine clinically. They're going to school, they're playing sports. This response remains abnormal in these young athletes. What it means, we don't really know, but it's there. And again, other groups are now uh, re reproducing this finding. So I think we can think of, uh, at least in that first week or so after injury, there's a switching problem um, in terms of autonomic function after a mild TBI or concussion. Uh, remember, the autonomic nervous system is engaging the environmental conditions imposed upon you. And if you have to get parasympathetic to digest your food or go to sleep, people with concussion can't seem to engage that. So some people report nausea or they report insomnia. Conversely, if you have to get sympathetic and exercise, lots of people with concussion report exercise intolerance. They can't switch from one to the other, depending upon the environmental uh, demands of, of what they're supposed to do. So we have a switching problem, at least in terms of autonomic function. Now, why would you even consider exercise to maybe improve uh, or address this? So here I've listed what concussion and actual physical deconditioning, taking an athlete out of his or her sport for weeks on end will do to these parts of your nervous system, the autonomic, the control of cerebral blood flow, neuroplasticity or neuron repair, psychological and sleep issues. We know that if you decondition an athlete, all of these go south and concussion actually does the same thing. Exercise, by the way, or exercise training improves all these things, including something called carbon dioxide sensitivity, which I won't discuss today. It improves the regulation of cerebral blood flow, especially during activity, up regulates genes that are responsible for neuron repair. And we know it has very good effects on mood and sleep. So there are many reasons exercise might be beneficial to someone who has a concussion. So a number of years ago, we thought about this when some of our athletes were just not getting better with uh, telling them to rest and do nothing until all, all their symptoms went away. And we thought, well, if we can exercise cardiac patients with angina after heart attacks, why not find out where a concussed person might have a safe level of exercise? So we developed this uh, treadmill test that was borrowed from the cardiac literature called a Balti protocol. And we put the patient on the treadmill, monitor the heart rate, and we have a visual analog scale and an exertion scale I'll show you. And every minute we increase the, uh, the difficulty of the test, monitor their heart rate and ask them if their symptoms are changing and how hard they're working. If they stop because they're symptom limited by concussion symptoms, that is their headache gets worse, or they're more dizzy or nauseous or blurred vision, we, we stop the test, that's called their threshold and we get their heart rate. And then we use that heart rate as I'll show you in a minute. Now, initially we did this in those who had prolonged post-concussive symptoms because we did not want to do it early on during that sort of acute metabolic crisis of concussion that's there within the first days to week. We thought um, we, we didn't want to increase their symptoms, delay the recovery. So we did it when they were outside of that metabolic crisis window. And we published that it was safe and reliable in, in that population. Um, if, however, at some point the, the athlete can go to maximum exertion, now that doesn't necessarily mean maximum heart rate, but it means they stop because they're tired or their legs are burning. They're stopping for reasons other than concussion symptom elevation. We declare them cardiovascularly and we think cerebrovascularly recovered. Again, we haven't proven that, but clinically it seems to work out. And we let them start to exercise at that point. They don't go back to play, but they can start to exercise. And a few years ago, uh, for the data I showed you before on the um, uh, the tilt table, we, we developed a bike test validated against the treadmill, and we use that in, in uh, data collection and in people who can't go on, on a treadmill. Now, before I move on to some of the basics of it, I just want to show you, we have information now that this exercise intolerance, again, the theory is that it's, it's originating someplace from autonomic dysfunction in the brainstem. Well, um, you know, how do we know that? Well, it's just a theory, but in this study, we had 32 concussed adolescents within a week of injury, and then we had a control group of 25 healthy controls. And we um, did uh, the Buffalo concussion treadmill test and then did brain DTIs on them. And we were trying to correlate their symptoms and DTI findings on uh, the MRI test. And we broke up uh, the brain into these different sections, you know, the frontal lobes, the parietal, temporal, uh, posterior, and, and the brainstem uh, here. And what we found was that when we looked at uh, the data on the DTI, 
the exercise intolerant subjects had most of the findings uh, in uh, the brainstem itself. Uh, nausea was up there too. Uh, we had patients with more cognitive findings who had their DTI changes up in the frontal lobes, which you would expect as well. But after Bonferroni correction, the exercise intolerant group was localizing mainly to the brainstem. So uh, again, uh, trying to link, link this exercise intolerance and maybe the effect of exercise to this autonomic center, uh, we're trying to do that. We haven't proven that yet, but the, da the data, uh, at least in this study, uh, point to that. Hasn't been published yet. So this, let's go back to the test. Um, so the, the patient gets on the test and we ask them before they get on, how are you feeling? Um, you know, how do you feel today on this scale? Are you a one, are you a three, are you a five, are you a seven? And it's kind of a generalized feeling. You know, they usually have headaches and they're fatigued and, and maybe they're dizzy. Um, and then at each minute, we ask them, are your symptoms changing? Once the symptoms go up by three points or more from baseline, we stop the test. We call that the threshold. And you might say, why is that? Well, some theory early on, but then just sort of uh, doing enough tests and figuring out where this, this sort of significant uh, threshold lied. So if someone says, I'm a three, and at minute 10 of the test, they're now a six, we stop the test, okay? We do not do the test in someone with very high resting symptoms because you will make them more symptomatic and we don't want to push them too hard. So mild symptom exacerbation is okay, severe we want to avoid. Um, but this is, how, uh, this is how we do it. A new symptom may appear as well. Someone may become dizzy halfway through the test and they weren't dizzy in the beginning. We give them a point for that as well. Now this, I hope this, this is just a sort of a visual description and you can see there's no audio, but this is a soccer athlete about 10 days, two weeks out, who is still symptomatic. And we're going to give him um, an exercise prescription. And you can see he's starting. You can just look at him and see he's starting to, uh, you know, be in distress here. And we don't want to push him too far beyond this. And we stop the test shortly after this. But you can see he's walking on this treadmill. He's not running. He's a Division One soccer player. He should be running at 15 degrees and getting his heart rate 195. He's stopping at a heart rate of 150 because his symptoms went up. He's exercise intolerant. That's what it looks like. It's hard for people who don't know what to expect the first time to fake this, okay? I mean, theoretically, somebody could, but it's not easy to do it. Now, we can also use this principle of exercise intolerance in diagnosing concussion. We don't just use it to treat, but if you're not sure, you can actually use this to help you um, raise the pretest probability that your patient is concussed. So this was a paper a few years ago where we did a randomized trial of giving the patient the treadmill test in the first week after concussion or not. They were high school athletes. Um, and we then followed their symptoms daily for a month. We were trying to find out how safe it was to exercise someone early on. We didn't want to harm their recovery, but we didn't know it. So we did the test early on. These are high school athletes. Every, uh, all of the 27 adolescents who got the treadmill test, who were independently diagnosed by a doctor with a concussion were exercise intolerant on the test. That is, they, they could not go past 70% of their age predicted maximum heart rate without their concussion symptoms going up and the test was stopped. In uh, a recent randomized trial that I'll discuss later of 118 uh, sport related concussed adolescents, 96% of them were exercise intolerant within one week of injury. Uh, so right now, um, I, I think all the research on biomarkers and stuff is great, but you don't need an fMRI or a DTI or a blood test to diagnose concussion. You need a good history and physical. And if you're not sure and you're in an athletic setting and you can get this test uh, or any other kind of exertion test, uh, see if they're exercise intolerant. That should point you in the direction that this was indeed a concussion because we think this is a proxy for this abnormal physiology, uh, autonomic control of cerebral blood flow. In our NIH grant, we've measured peripheral oxygen delivery and, and peripheral uh, uh, cardiac function. And we don't think that's really limited in concussed patients. So it's not a, uh, an oxygen delivery to muscle issue. It's more a control of cerebral blood flow issue we think that's stopping them. So um, if we accept that there's some autonomic dysfunction after concussion and we want to treat it, really the best way is not with a drug, it's with uh, re regular aerobic exercise training because aerobic exercise training treats the entire autonomic nervous system, not just a part of it, sympathetic, parasympathetic, it treats the entire ANS. So we call exercise is medicine. 
Um, once we establish the diagnosis, either on a treadmill or a bike with a symptom limitation, we then give them 90% of that heart rate they got on the treadmill. That's their target heart rate to use. Now they have to have some way to know their heart rate because this is a, literally a dose of exercise we're giving them. And we don't want them to underdose and not get an effect. And we don't want them to overdose and get a side effect either. So they really have to have a way to measure their heart rate. We try to get them to do it a minimum of 20 minutes per day. They can warm up and cool down, but we basically tell them stop at that symptom exacerbation point. So mild symptoms are okay, but bad, you know, significant symptoms, you have to stop. Um, so if they want to go longer than 20 minutes, fine. If they have to stop at 10, that's okay too. Uh, but the point is then you go back to it the next day or in, in college athletes, we'll even do it sometimes a couple times a day. Certainly in pro athletes, we do that. Most people tolerate a bike first because they have some vestibular symptoms after concussion, but then they can get to running. We try to get them to do it every day of the week and we increase their target heart rate progressively every few days if they're doing well or every week either by retesting them, which you could do in a training room, or by just going up by five to 10 beats per minute as their target. Once they can get to 80% or more of their age predicted maximum heart rate for 20 minutes or more, for a couple of days in a row, we declare them physiologically, at least in, in, in terms of, we think aerobic exercise and, and cerebrovascular physiology recovered. Now let's look at some data and um, uh, in, in some other populations. This was a, a, a study a couple of years ago by Dr. Krawski out of Cincinnati, where he took kids who were uh, concussed and seen in the ED and they were symptomatic for more than a month and he randomly assigned them to stretching or aerobic exercise, okay, subthreshold exercise. And after about a week run in here, you see they start to separate and those who got the aerobic exercise recovered significantly faster than those who were given the placebo stretching condition. Why stretching? It's a good placebo because the athlete is doing something they're familiar with. It's a form of exercise, but it doesn't raise your heart rate. And we think the heart rate is the key to the aerobic exercise. So again, these were in patients who had prolonged symptoms beyond a month. This is that uh, study I, I mentioned before about where we randomly assigned uh, the treadmill test or not to kids within a week of concussion. And what you see here is whether you got the treadmill or not, the, the lines virtually completely overlap. That is, there was no increase in symptoms in the test subjects the day after or any delayed recovery in the patients who got the treadmill test compared to those who did not. So now they didn't get, no one got exercise treatment here. It was just um, treadmill test or not, um, but it wasn't harming them or delaying their recovery to do it even early on. Now, why would we do that? Uh, well, because if you want to use exercise early on, maybe to speed recovery, um, or improve concussion, then you want to do it in that first week. You don't want to wait uh, for two, three, four weeks. You don't want to do it early. So if we could test them early safely, then we could prescribe individualized exercise safely. So this was um, the first RCT we did uh, published in 2019. And what you see is uh, it's 15 years old. So these are high school athletes. The nice thing about this study was almost half of the subjects in each group, uh, an aerobic exercise and a stretching group were female. Um, you can see that they were seen within about five days of their injury, um, and they were pretty symptomatic, uh, all of them at that point. So this is being done in symptomatic high school athletes, males and females, within one week of concussion. And if you look at after about a week or so, those who got aerobic exercise start to separate out and recover faster than those who got stretching. This is a uh, Kaplan-Meier survival curve. Uh, what's the difference? 17 days for the stretching group versus 13 days for the aerobic exercise. That was significant. Now, what I was most interested in would, would, would the early treatment actually prevent some of them from having delayed recovery, which in adolescence you define as a month or more of symptoms. This was uh, a trend with only two in the aerobic group and seven in the placebo group going on to that, but it was not statistically significant because it was fairly uncommon in, in that sample. But the good news was that females responded to this as well as males. Uh, now you'll know that there's a number of studies out there show that females have more symptoms after concussion. Some studies show they take longer to recover, but it turns out if you treat them both the same, they recover at the same rate. Now, if you look at just resting concussion, uh, concussed adolescents and children after um, uh, injury, 
This is the big 5P study from Canada, Dr. Zemek, uh, Dr. Zemek's study. At one month, one third of them will report ongoing symptoms. So this was a study of 3,000 uh, kids uh, seen in the ER and then followed up at a month. 1,000 of them were still uh, symptomatic. In the, in the um, study I just showed you, 15% in placebo and 5% in aerobic exercise still had symptoms at a month, but this was not significant, at least statistically. So this is the study we just finished. This is a replication of the original study, but with more centers, more subjects, and a, and a much stronger design, actually, in terms of uh, not, not that we didn't randomize them. We did randomize them to exercise or stretching, but we used um, three centers, one in Buffalo, one in uh, Philadelphia, one in Boston. And in Philadelphia and Boston, they were hospital-based clinics that were seeing more injured, more symptomatic patients. In Buffalo, we tend to see a less injured, less symptomatic group. And so as a result, there were more patients in this study that had delayed recovery, okay, that beyond one month, 21% in the aerobic exercise group and almost a third in the stretching, much like Dr. Zemek's study had not recovered by day 29. So it's a more symptomatic group. But when we controlled for sex site and mean daily exercise time, the hazard ratio for developing PPCS was about 48% reduced in those who got aerobic exercise versus stretching. So we had a, a significant reduction in those who had gone on to that delayed recovery. And that's really the group that has the most problem, at least in high school, it's the delayed recoverers. They're having trouble with testing and, and going to school and psychological issues. So this showed for the first time that if you did something in that first week, you had a, a measurable effect on reducing delayed recovery uh, uh, beyond a month. And we, uh, so uh, we didn't show that with the first one, but we've shown it with the second one. And, and, and we had a significant reduction in those who, or faster recovery in those who got aerobic exercise than the stretching in the first month as well. When we looked at the per protocol analysis, that was an intent to treat analysis. All comers, if they drop out, they're included. You know, it's a real life situation, it's a stronger design. But when we looked at those who actually adhered to each program, we had heart rate monitors that we sent them home with. So we knew what heart rate they were getting to during their exercise sessions. Now, not all of them complied with that, but enough did. And if they were adherent, if they really did it, they recovered in about half the time uh, with aerobic exercise versus stretching, uh, 12 days versus, I can't see that, 20 something days. Um, and only 9% of those who really did the exercise program as they were instructed to do had delayed recovery versus about a third who did stretching. So no adverse events, no near misses. So we concluded that individualized early aerobic exercise reduced recovery time and significantly reduced uh, PPCS even better if they were adherent. That is, they really stuck to the program. Um, and we think that clinicians should not only permit but consider prescribing some sort of sub symptom threshold aerobic activity early on um, because I think it might help them uh, recover faster and it might help them uh, avoid becoming one of those uh, you know, sort of miserable post-concussion uh, patients that uh, go on for months. Prolonged rest and avoidance of physical activity until spontaneous symptom resolution, uh, you know, I believe is no longer an acceptable approach to caring for these patients. I think, I think the, the answer is that they have to do some sort of uh, uh, moderate or mild level of, of physical and probably cognitive activity. Um, some other interesting um, aspects of this study um, we combined the two RCTs into one to look at the effects of exercise on physical signs of concussion. So everybody looks at symptoms of concussion, right? But everyone in here does a physical examination if you're a physician taking care of patients, and I do. And I want to know, because physical signs are a more objective measure of neurologic injury than symptoms are. Symptoms are just too nonspecific. So we wanted to know, what's the effect on the physical examination of this approach? So um, again, the main outcome variable was PPCS, 29 days or more of symptoms. And we had 81 uh, subjects in aerobic exercise and 97 in stretching, 15 years old, two thirds male. And we separated them out to those who had three or less physical examination findings. And these were defined as problems with their ocular motor exam and their vestibular exam. So think the VOMS test basically with a tandem gate thrown in. And then we had a group that had four or five findings. So three or less versus four or five. And if we look here at 
this group here. This is the this is the group that has the four or five findings. So they're more they're more severely injured. They have more physical examination findings as indicators of their concussion. They uh, responded much better to aerobic exercise than stretching. There's some literature out there that says that people with signs of concussion should rest. They shouldn't exercise. And we wanted to see if that was holding true in, in this study. And in fact, we found the opposite. We found that the people who had more physical examination signs of concussion, more ocular motor and vestibular problems, they actually responded better to aerobic exercise and giving them a placebo stretcher. Now they didn't recover as fast as those who got, who had fewer findings. That's probably not, not going to happen. But if you gave them exercise, they responded quite well to it. So we think it works even in those who have more physical signs of concussion. Um, and it's not harmful to do that for them. I know this is a really busy slide, um, but this is sort of, um, and, I, and I hope there's a handout or something where or you can get the slides, but anyway, this is sort of a, a rubric for how we go through this and use, we can use uh, exertion testing uh, early on to sort of take us down different pathophysiologic uh, 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 pathways and, and treatment pathways, you know, to get your patients better. So, you know, you, you see someone with, with a concussion and you want to rule out the red flags, of course. You want to rule out the signs of intracranial bleeding or cervical spine fracture. Um, and, and again, you know, once you rule out the emergencies, then you can, you know, do your history and physical. And I, I, again, in some instances, if you have access to a physical therapist, a trainer, an exercise physiologist, someone who can do some sort of exertion testing, you can look for an early symptom limited threshold or not. If they don't have one, you look at your cervical spine, your vestibular ocular findings, your psychiatric migraine phenotypes, and you go down to individualized care, multidisciplinary care. If they have early symptom limited threshold, we think that's more of an autonomic phenotype and we can use submaximal exercise. You can use it in these patients as well. It doesn't hurt to use it, but they need other treatments. They don't just need exercise, they need other treatments. As everyone in this room, I think, knows, it's a multidisciplinary approach to uh, treating uh, many of these concussion patients. When we looked at this in about 200 subjects, this sort of approach, the majority of the symptoms that were responsible for prolonged symptoms, six, eight weeks, three, four months of symptoms, were in the cervical spine, the ocular motor, and vestibular systems. They were not from physiological concussion. That is, they had normal exercise tolerance, but they had these findings on physical examination that explain their symptoms to a large degree. Um, there was a group here in this pie that were the worried well. They were patients who were attributing their symptoms to an injury three months, six months ago, and we really couldn't find much physically wrong with them in terms of their exercise tolerance or their physical, and we, we felt they were just anxious and, and uh, you know, hadn't been told that they, they didn't have a brain injury anymore. And this is important because some of these patients just need to be told I don't think your brain is the cause of, of your underlying symptoms. I think it may be your pre-existing depression or you have a stress in your life or whatever, but this is an important group uh, to, for physicians and clinicians to uh, determine. Now, there are other treatments, as you know, for these other uh, issues we see after concussion. So Catherine Schneider showed that multimodal physical therapy in patients with prolonged symptoms addressing the neck and the vestibular system was really effective at getting them back to play versus a sham uh, control, uh, control. So again, we, we have randomized control trial evidence that uh, this approach works in those with persistent symptoms. Now, the group out in Washington, uh, McCarty et al., they um, had a group of persistent symptoms, largely um, um, affective and cognitive, et cetera. They were troubling, trouble in school. So they did a randomized control trial versus usual care where they had advocacy and coordination with schools regarding accommodations, they did cognitive behavioral therapy. They even did psychopharmacological intervention if needed. And that model uh, reduced their symptoms significantly more than the model where they just sort of did usual care, you know, um, follow up until your symptoms go away, uh, things like that. So for patients who have lots of return to learn problems, uh, et cetera, this is an approach that may be very effective uh, for that group. Now, um, Again, I want to emphasize exercise as a treatment is not the return to sports strategy. It's using exercise to get you to that point. Um, so it's done while the patient is symptomatic. They are not asymptomatic. And we're trying to speed recovery, reduce the incidence of delayed recovery, and get them to the return to play program as 
fast and as safely as possible. Um, a couple of years ago, we, we, or last year rather, we put out this paper where we, we give several methods for doing this. If you don't have access to a treadmill or a bike, for example, um, and you can't do exertion testing, and even if you can't do a heart rate monitor, and we base it on their sim degree of symptom exacerbation during that stage of exercise. And we just tell the patient how to progress. We give them a form and they can do this even if they don't have access to a trainer, a therapist, or an exertion test. So we can use this principle and, and make it a little more generalizable to those who don't ac access these kinds of, of uh, specialists with uh, the ability to do a treadmill test or a bike test. So I just put this up. This is, um, we're starting to build up an evidence base of moderate levels of physical activity and prescribed aerobic exercise being good for concussion recovery. We're now developing randomized controlled trials of this. You know, the earlier studies were mostly retrospective um, and some of them were not controlled, but now we're getting good control randomized trials saying that this appears to be an effective way to treat a concussed adolescents at least. And others are doing it in, in adults and finding good results, not as good as with athletes, but, but good results nonetheless. Uh, the last thing I'd like to touch on if I have uh, time is that, um, I think it was a month or two ago, Dr. Herring gave uh, uh, one of these talks and I, I just really uh, enjoyed it. And Stan's a, a brilliant guy. And he, you know, he, he said, you know, we haven't taken into account the psychological effects of these interventions. And I think we should, and going forward, we're gonna do that more in Buffalo. And part of this, I, I think part of the reason this works is it's active. Athletes resonate with it. We're getting to them early. We're seeing them frequently. We're not getting to them a month later and then seeing them a month after that. We're seeing them in the first week. We see them every week. They're working on something every day and they're, they're getting more, more self-empowerment, uh, uh, efficacious, locus of control. So if you look at this in other parts of medicine, there's really a strong relationship between patient empowerment and say medication adherence. So if, if you can establish high levels of self-efficacy and internal health locus of control, and with the doctor or the clinician participating in that, this really improves medication adherence. So maybe this, you know, this attitude between the doctor and the patient and being positive about you can, you can treat your concussion, you know, we can help you get better. That's probably motivating people to want to get better. And I, I don't think we should discount that as a, a real possibility here. And again, we have to look at our biases. We have to take a step back. Uh, confirmation bias, again, you know, uh, you tend to believe, um, you tend to uh, believe evidence that reinforces your own predetermined beliefs, right? So, uh, you know, if, you, if you're designing pathways with particular research interests in, in mind, in my case, exercise, well, geez, if exercise works, that means it must work for everybody. But remember Simon and Garfunkel in the box or a man hears what he wants to hear and he disregards the rest. We have to be careful uh, to avoid that. So it's uncomfortable um, to hold contradictory uh, opinions or cognitions and to minimize that people may just go down the path they think is right. And I think we have to, you know, and especially in my case and, and others in this field, realize that um, there's a broader range of possibilities here we have to look at other, other possible mechanisms. It's probably not just the autonomic nervous system, uh, but that may be part of the, the, the healing response for concussion. So to wrap up here, the old view of course was to rest your brain. And I use the ACL uh, tear injury analogy. We used to put the ACL tear in a cast and wait for it to heal. Uh, any physical therapist in the audience will realize that's malpractice right now. Uh, they have surgery uh, to take care of it and active rehab. Well, I think we were putting our brains at rest for far too long in the past. Not that anyone in this audience is doing that, but I still get some patients who are cocooned for far too long and I'm trying to get the word out, uh, especially with uh, Berlin. The next meeting is gonna be, I think in Amsterdam um, uh, in 2022. And now instead of strict rest, the idea is relative rest for a few days. Now. If a kid has a concussion on Sunday, I don't think you should go to school on Monday. I think you have to take a day or two off school right after the injury because too many times their symptoms go up. But right after that, when they stabilize, we should be getting them back into their activity, including school, gradually if needed, accommodations, half days if needed, sure. But we want to get them back. We talk a lot about cognitive and physical thresholds and that there are emerging treatments for concussion now. We think exercise treats the ANS. We haven't proven that, but we think it. But all these other therapies for these uh, physical examination abnormalities that you identify are proving to be very effective for concussed patients. And we don't wanna 
wait too long until we employ them. Um, so this is one of my lame jokes. That's my handwriting now. Uh, actually, it's worse than that uh, over the years. But anyway, what it, the translation is don't cocoon. You know, we have an evidence-based treatment now that we think is aimed at the physiology or one of the components of the physiology of concussion that can prevent prolonged symptoms in adolescence after sport concussion. And we have emerging active treatments for the different etiologies of prolonged symptoms in all patients now. So I'll stop there. Um, I want to thank you for your attention. And it's been, um, been fun for me. Thank you. That's just right Thank you, Dr. Letty. That was amazing stuff and exciting. Um, so a reminder, everybody, hopefully you guys can hear me now. I heard you couldn't hear me before. Uh, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A, not the chat. Uh, unless anyone's got any pressing questions from the audience, I can start with the Q&A online. Good? Okay. So first question, what are Dr. Letty's criteria to clear an athlete to return to play? Does he include formal neuropsych testing to determine readiness to return to play? I do not. Um, my criteria for return to play are three. Um, can you hear me? Great. Help oh, me. <laughs> um, it's a return to a baseline level of symptoms. So that does not mean asymptomatic. It means a baseline level of symptoms because some people have headaches before their concussion uh, or some fatigue before their concussion. So it's a baseline level of symptoms, a normal physical examination, which includes a cognitive or you know, some cognitive testing base, basic cognitive testing um, of memory, et cetera, but not formal neuropsych testing. Um, a normal ocular motor and vestibular examination, cranial nerve examination, and normal balance, and a normal neck examination as well. And um, in athletes, I like to know that they have normal exercise tolerance. Now, that doesn't mean I put everybody on a treadmill um, to uh, determine that they're uh, recovered completely. But I do ask them about, uh, you know, because generally we're giving them something to do and is what we're giving them to do causing symptoms. At that point, they can go through the return to play program. If they pass through that, then I'm satisfied that they've restored their normal exercise tolerance for that sport. And then they're clear to resume sport. If they want to know, for example, can I start um, earlier on in my sport specific, uh, say soccer exercises? Well, I'll tell them well, if you want to do a treadmill or a bike test and prove that you have good exercise tolerance aerobically and you pass that, you can start at stage three because you've already done stages one and two. So you can approach it that way as well. So there are different ways to do it, but, um, baseline level of symptoms, normal physical, that's really important. Um, and then uh, a, a normal degree of exercise tolerance, whether that's um, by going through the graded progression without return of symptoms or doing some sort of exertion test and then starting at stage three and going through the rest with no return of symptoms. They pass all those, they're clear to go back in my mind. If they're having cognitive symptoms still, I don't let them go back. And I'm not saying I never use cognitive testing, but I don't use it unless they're still having cognitive problems say beyond a month. Can the vestibular profile after concussion delay exercise induced physiological recovery? The vestibular profile. Hmm. <laughs> Boy, that's a good question, which means I don't know the answer. Um, well, I think if you're still having significant vestibular problems, it's gonna be hard to recover normal exercise tolerance. So um, that's how I would think uh, it might affect. So I think, I think what in that case, your, your, your aerobic exercise training uh, could still be done, but it wouldn't be as fast. It would be slower, okay? Now, some vestibular therapists believe that aerobic exercise is part or can contribute to recovery of the vestibular system. That you, you need vestibular exercises as well, but the neuroplasticity of aerobic exercise is actually good for the vestibular system. And there's some evidence out there that um, aerobic exercise training actually helps minor vestibular systems go away, symptoms go away, or signs go away without any vestibular exercise intervention itself. 
So I, I think if you were quite vestibular, and some of these patients are, you know, they have terrible balance um, or they can't move their head without getting dizzy, uh, they're going to have to be on a bike and go very slowly. Uh, and in conjunction with vestibular training, then they will eventually recover. But their recovery will probably de be delayed because we know significant vestibular involvement will delay recovery. At my school, we have the protocol going back into the classroom by progression, such as no school, half day, full day, and removal to a quiet area, wearing glasses, et cetera. Then they progress them to return to competition phase. Do you have any guidelines for return to cognitive function or progression, such as no full days of school, half days until symptoms decrease or overlap the return to learn with the return to competition due to the evidence showing aerobic exercise being beneficial? Can you, can, you repeat, can you repeat that question? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, the answer is yes. No, um, <laughs> um, I'm just talking to Alyssa about this. <laughs> return to learn uh, is, as you know, uh, as important, if not more than return to sport and should occur before they return to their sport. Um, I, I think from the, uh, the question of what they may be getting at is, if I may interpret this, does, does aerobic exercise help the return to learn um, pro, uh, process as well? I think it does um, because it's, it's good for your brain, right? Uh, we know that uh, without question that aerobic exercise is good for the healthy brain. So why isn't it good for the concussed brain? I think it is if you do it the right way. Um, so we use that approach that was described here. If someone is really having trouble with school um, you know, beyond that first week, let's say, uh, I will either uh, take them out for a little while, or we, we might we might negotiate half day school. Sometimes now you can do half at home on Zoom and half in person, or just half days until they're feeling better. Um, and then, you know, we we just build it up gradually, kind of like you do with with exercise. Unfortunately, that has not been studied as empirically as exercise. And I was discussing this with one of the graduate students here in Michigan. Um, and, and we need more data on that. And, and I hope her, her study comes out. And we, you know, I think it's gonna be really interesting, but we need, we need more people to study that. What's the best way for, for school accommodations to work? I, I, you know, we use kind of the same approach, but it's, it's very, uh, you know, it's very, it's based on opinion. It's not empirically based. Um, and you know it's going to be different. I'm sure in different uh, academic situations, different ages, but it needs a lot. It needs a lot of study. I'm not trying to not answer the question. It's just I don't have a good answer for it based on data. Um, but we, we use the same types of accommodations. I think I think getting people physically active helps their their cognitive symptoms and helps them reintegrate into school. You know, I don't take kids out of gym class. What I do is I take them out of contact and team sports in gym class, and I have them do their aerobic exercise during gym class. So they're not sitting there writing papers, which I think is crazy, but that happens in some schools where I am. They, if you're taken out of gym class, you have to do a, a report. Well, people with concussion can't do that. You know, they, if that's worse than being in gym class. So I just have them do um, walking around the gym or on the treadmill or on the bike and let, let the team sports take, take place, but we keep them active in, in school. So that's the best I can answer that right now. In honor of time, anyone in the audience, live, in person, audience? <laughs> okay. Yeah. So in your in your uh, the groups you study with exercise, uh, once once they um, the group that has normal recovery, uh, and then you have the group that has prolonged recovery. In those groups, have you studied the function of the autonomic nervous system to see if that's playing a role in prolonged recovery? No, um, but we'd, we'd like to. Um, so in, in the studies where we, we've given exercise or stretching, uh, we haven't had um, an autonomic mechanism as part of the trial. Okay? That's the next step is is if someone who has more, say, auto or dysautonomia, do they take longer to recover than someone who doesn't in the beginning? Um, it's, it's a very interesting question. Um, it might take a lot of subjects, uh, Matt, because there are so many different reasons for delayed recovery and probably not just autonomic. You know, if, if your eyes are bouncing all over the place for a while, you, you may have delayed recovery. 
But I think it's it's an interesting question and probably answerable if if you can design the study right. And uh, it 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 goes back to why does exercise work? We really don't know. Um, and part of the real issue is, as I showed with that study that Steve was on before and from our own data, when you test uh, kids who were concussed more than a year ago, um, they still have that flat response on the cold presser test. I mean, why? They, they're not having symptoms, they're playing their sport or they're in school, yet their autonomic nervous system is different than controls. So in untreated patients, these are patients who never got any treatment, by the way. So in untreated patients, you have this sort of persistent low-grade dysautonomia that may be subclinical, it's not, doesn't appear to be interfering with them, but are they at risk for something else down the line? Is that one reason they're at risk for another concussion? And what does treatment do to that? Does treatment reverse that, you know? So, and, and again, in terms of severity, are those who are really dysautonomic taking longer to recover than those who are not? It's really a good question. And we just don't have the information yet, but I'd love to do the study. Yeah, yeah me too, I bet. One more question. I know there's a lot on the on the Q and A, but uh, in the fact that we're a few minutes over, um, do you think the acute metabolic crisis plays a role in the ANS disruption in the subsequent days? Yeah, I think you'd have to assume that um, because um, of that. We know from Dr. Giza's great work that cerebral blood flow is affected very soon after concussion, and in, in the in, the, in the, those pilot data I showed you, uh, even in the acutely concussed males, um, which was done within a few days of their injury, you saw different blood flow patterns in the central autonomic network. So I think cerebral blood flow regulation in that part of the brain, yes, uh, definitely affects autonomic function in some of these people. Um, what would have been great is if we had that and, and an autonomic measure right at the same time, but that's for kind of another study. Um, but I suspect it does. I suspect that acute metabolic crisis, especially with respect to cerebral uh, blood flow regulation, which is under autonomic control largely, uh, if that's off after concussion and your central autonomic network isn't getting the right blood supply, supply um, or distribution during activities, let's say, then, then that's, that's part of it uh, for sure. I, yeah, I think they're very interconnected. Uh, so I would agree with that statement, yeah. Well, we're over our time, so I just wanted to remind everyone that we will post the talk on our website, theconcussion.umich.edu, in a few days. And if you'd like, you can follow us on Twitter at umich, at umich concussion. And please join us uh, on November 11th for our first concussion and cocktails with uh, Dr. Adam Finkel. It will be another hybrid in-person and um, virtual event. And our next quarterly speaker series will be with Dr. Douglas Smith from Penn on January 27th. Thank you everyone for your time. I'm going Thank to you, Dr. One. Letty. <laughs> Come back. Yeah, yeah, that's a great one. Thank you. It yeah. was a pleasure. Thank you so it was fun. Much.